Hello everyone and welcome to a very special edition of what's on my desk. As you can see, I have, uh, well, I don't know, about 50 plus Audemars Piguet's on my desk, as well as two on my wrist. I never double wear watches, but this is a very special episode. You guys know AP is my favorite brand. So today I wanna to talk about AP and their significance in the history of watchmaking. Of course, uh, I'm gonna have to turn all these watches back around so I can see them as I talk about them. Uh, Ian, kick the intro. Okay, I guess the intro wasn't long enough. I still need a little bit of time to turn this around, so bear with me a second. Ian, speed this up, please. Is that all? So, my favorite, favorite brand in the whole wire. Well, why is this my favorite brand? It's the fact that it's still an independent brand that doesn't belong to any big company or group for that matter. And it's a brand with a lot of firsts, a lot of history behind them. And aesthetically, I feel that Audemars Piguet makes the best looking watches. And from a complications perspective, this is what started the brand, that they started with complications. And this is how the brand was born, but I'll get into that in just a second. Let's talk about history. Born in the historic Valais de Joux, or Valley of Joux, Joux, again, I'm not big on French, which is the heart of Swiss watchmaking. This is a magical place. This was a place back in the day that was rich in natural resources, such as iron, which were essential to the making of some of these pieces. And this is where in 1875, a gentleman by the name of Louise Audemars, as well as another gentleman by the name of Edward Piguet, created the company Audemars Piguet as we know it now. The company's been family owned since its founding, which to me in today's day and age of all these groups is mind blowing. Of course, both Audemars and Piguet were previously watchmakers and they were making complicated movements before Audemars Piguet was started. And, uh, the most notable client of theirs was Tiffany and Company back before they started. Of course, Piguet specialized in regulation of the movements and once they got together, they sort of split responsibilities within the company. Audemars was in charge of production and Piguet was concentrated on the business end of things such as sales and management. Let's go back to Auto one of Audemars Piguet's slogans. To break the rules, you must first master them. And if you think about that slogan, it really takes you back to the roots and the history of this company. This is a company whose roots and origins are in complicated timepieces. 1892, the world's first minute repeating wristwatch, which was sold to Louise Brandt. Omega. 1889, they manufactured a grand complications pocket watch that had seven complications. It included a grand and small strike minute repeater. It had an alarm, it had a deadbeat seconds, it had a perpetual calendar, chronograph, split second chronograph hand, and jumping hour. That was an amazing feat in horology and not something that a lot of their peers could do at the time. Again, we're going back to 1899. In 1921, they created the first jump hour wristwatch. And then in 1934, they introduced the first skeleton watch, which was a big feat on its own. 46, they introduced the world's thinnest watch, 1.64 millimeters in size, which is tiny. Then of course in 1972, this is what I believe turned their world upside down and the watch world upside down. They introduced what's known to be the first luxury sports watch and that was the Royal Oak. Obviously, you guys know that was designed by Gerald Genta during the quartz crisis as they call it in the industry. And this is what I believe took Audemars Piguet into the stratosphere and made him the company that they are today. We into the f***ing stratosphere! And one of the watches, of course, I'm wearing is the Royal Oak that you guys always see me wear. My very first Ace Serial Royal Oak Jumbo at 39 millimeters. I'll show you this guy once again as if you haven't seen it before. But this is the original from 1972. This is what started the whole revolution. Another surprise I have for you guys, I actually recently picked up its counterpart in a two-tone version. He's exactly the same watch from 1972 in a two-tone version. So it's stainless steel and 18 karat gold with a gold dial. Let me put it side by side so you guys sort of see what that looks like. I have not seen this watch around at all in a two-tone. There are plenty out there in gold, two-tone, have not seen much. 1986, they created an ultra thin automatic tourbillon. This watch measured 5.3 millimeters, including the case. Again, not something that anyone has done to date, if you think about it. 1995, world's first automatic grand complication watch. 2006, the world's first direct impulse escapement. And it was based on a design of a watchmaker, Robert Robin, from the 18th century. 2007, 2008, the world's first carbon 
case and carbon movement watch, i.e. the carbon concept that they came out with. This is what started the whole carbon craze. And this is just a few notable things that I wanted to mention before diving a little bit deeper into some of the collections. And speaking of collections, Audemars Piguet were one of the first to actually make collection within their watches. They were the ones that started this trend to begin with. They were the ones that set, had the Jules collection. They're the ones that had the Royal Oak collection, the Royal Oak Offshore collection, uh, the Edward Piguet collection, the Millinery, and so on and so forth. They were the ones that decided, you know what, we're going to separate our watches by collections and everybody else follows suit. If you look at any manufacturer today, they all have collections of some sort. Some, some call it differently. Some have, call it brands within the brands and so on and so forth. But for the most part, it was AP that started that trend. And yes, there were a trendsetter in many, many ways, starting with the first luxury watch starting with carbon starting with the use of ceramics at a later time as well as making collections within the brand so where do i start i'm going to start with the roots the jules audemars here's a skeleton tribune chronograph from audemars pk a gorgeous watch they have it in rose gold as well as in a white gold i still can't make up my mind which not which one i like better but again skeleton tribune chronograph this is that traditional watchmaking that Audemars Piguet always spoke about. So obviously Jules Audemars is named after one of the owners, that hence they, how they came up with that collection. Not very creative, but hey, why not? It carries the name fourth in history and it will sit forever, as they say. Every Jules Audemars out there, it takes cue from their original designs. You have things like a ladies piece. Again, traditional round shape. This is a ladies chronograph. It's somewhat sporty, somewhat dressy. You have some more complicated stuff like the equations of time and they have them in various pieces. And this was a limited edition done for Arnold Schwarzenegger, All Stars Foundation. This is a dual time in platinum. And again, Jules Audemars Piguet may not be the most popular model today from Audemars Piguet, but it's going to stay around forever because, again, it takes you back to their history all the way back to 1875 when they made their first complicated timepieces. They were in that traditional round case. Let's talk about the millinery. Millinery was launched in 1995. The idea behind the unique design was to give the viewer sort of a three-dimensional take on a standard watch movement. And that's why they're characterized by oval cases as well as like somewhat domed sapphire crystals. If you guys can see that if I turn this this way. The offset of watch style is notable with a view of the balance wheel. And Audemars Piguet claims that the caliber 41 is reversed to allow more components to be seen on a dial. And again, all of the millinery watches share the case and unique Damascus of Cote de Genève across the movement dial, as you can see here. Uh, lots of beautiful ladies pieces are done in the millinery collection. Here I have just an old diamond out millinery as well as what they call the zebra. I don't think AP officially calls this watch the zebra, but it certainly looks like a zebra. And again, same characteristics. Open movement here. Can't see majority of the movement, but again, these watches for the ladies are meant to be more on a dressier side, obviously. Of course, if you turn the zebra over, you can certainly see majority of the movement in the back. It's a beautiful dress piece, it's a beautiful jewelry piece, but at the same token, it's still a magnificent timepiece that can be enjoyed by a female just as much as a male, if that makes sense. Earlier, I mentioned to you guys the Royal Oak 1972 uh, coming out during that quartz crisis. AP had an answer for the quartz crisis as well, and I think I may have shown you this watch before. The 6001 was Audemars' answer to the quartz crisis. This is a quartz timepiece. Not many of these left around and the reason for that is because the same beta movement that's inside this watch was used in the paddock quartz watches and a few years back there was a craze in collecting those and the movements in them cannot be fixed so a lot of people would find a watch like this that traded for four or five thousand dollars with a working movement take the movement out put it into the paddock watch to get that watch working and that watch would sell for twenty thousand dollars which by the way there's nothing wrong with that because nobody would even be able to tell that that movement was taken from an ap and put into a paddock because they're identical those movements and i also mentioned them making slim watches here's a little vintage time piece from AP in white gold. We talked about making these classic slim watches. Look at that. That's pretty slim, if you ask me. Of course, outside of uh, the lines I just mentioned, there was the Edward Piguet line, uh, which were the rectangular shaped watches. Unfortunately, I don't have any here, but I'm sure Ian can pop a few on the screen, which again, came uh, in a plain Jane watch all the way out to a Turbion, perpetual calendar, etc. There was the museum collection. It was a humongous square watch manual wind and platinum. They, went, they made a limited edition run. Audemars Piguet has always ventured outside those core lines, but right now your core lines are your millinery, your Jules Audemars. They recently introduced Code 1159, which is, to me, it's like a mix of a Royal Oak with a Jules Audemars. I don't, I don't 
didn't know how to classify that, which did okay. You know, people were making a lot of fun of it, but guess what? They only made about 1,500 pieces in total of those uh, time pieces, and they are selling. They're not selling as well as, let's say, the Royal Oaks 15500s, but they're still selling. Which brings me to my favorite, which brings me back to the Royal Oak connection. We go back once again to year 1972. Gerald Genta was inspired by a traditional diving helmet. That's why the exposed screws, a lot of people actually don't know that. And once again, here's one from 1972. This is the one that started it all, that started the Royal Oak, the Royal Oak Offshore, and everything else that you see following. Here's some bit later examples. Uh, these are also considered vintage right now from the 80s. Here's your day date from Royal Oak. This was done in a smaller 36 millimeter. You have to remember at the time in 1972 when he came out with the 39 millimeter Royal Oak, that was a humongous watch for the industry. It was considered to be huge at 39 millimeters and bulky. So they scaled it down a bit to sort of satisfy market needs and they went with 36 millimeter Royal Oaks. And again, they made them in various complications. I just happened to have these examples here, the day date and the, and the one with the moon phase as well. And then the Royal Oak involved the various designs, various complications, as well as various sizes. Here's a 39 millimeter Royal Oak chronograph, right? Blue dial. The later Royal Oak was in a 41 millimeter, such as this rose gold piece. And this is one of the later versions. Prior to that, they had the plain Jane white and black dial, if you guys remember these in rose gold. The Royal Oak Turbion was born. This was a huge watch. It's a 45 millimeter watch, right? Most people mistake this for an offer, but it's not. This is actually a Royal Oak in a 45 millimeter case. And you had various metal. For example, this is a white gold Royal Oak on a strap. You know, you came out with your steel, they did the chronograph, and they did the chronograph in various metals, and all the way up to today, where you have the coveted skeleton, right? In the 41 millimeter. They did the 39 first, and then they did this guy in a 41 millimeter. This watch still trades at double its list price. Remember I talked about the carbon craze? Guess what? That was the Royal Oak concept. And again, this is not an offshore. This is actually a Royal Oak. Although this watch is humongous, it's still part of their Royal Oak collection, not the offshore collection. And this is the watch that uh, is near and dear to my heart for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is what came out right after the first Alacrite concept, which I've talked about in the past and I've showed you this watch before. And if, you, if I wish I had the other one here weight wise and, and uh, it's just night and day, this watch is so, so extremely light. And guess what? From the birth of this watch, not only AP, but every other company under the sun started following suit and making carbon watches. What else was there? Of course, you had your diamond encrusted stuff. You guys remember my diamond Royal Oak? Well, here it is. There's the Royal Oak Chrono again with a full pave case, and it's still that Royal Oak chronograph. Royal Oak collection is probably the biggest grown collection, I should call it, in terms of variations. I don't think there are as many variants of a Jules Audemars or Edward Piguet or Millionaire for that matter as they are of Royal Oaks, and rightfully so. It's the most successful collection, so you're gonna ride the wave, and I don't blame them for doing that. So 1972, Royal Oak was born 20 years later to mark the anniversary of the birth of the Royal Oak. The company came out with the Royal Oak Offshore. Of course, it was officially introduced in 1993, hence we just celebrated last year their 25th anniversary, and they came out with an offshore that looks like the other watch that I have on my wrist. And this is the only reason I double-wristed my watches today. So guess what? This is another new pickup that I guys told you. One of the episodes is going to be a surprise. This is the original offshore. This is the one. This is a D serial. This is the original offshore from 1993. Again, it's just as collectible now as my original Royal Oak. Not as expensive quite yet, but sure it will be shortly because there's not many of these left. They only made a few in the D serial. Uh, there were actually a few offshores from 92, 93 era, which they made without the serial number. The watch only had a number, it didn't have the D serial. Those are the first, first uh, offshores that ever came out. There's probably a handful of them out there and they trade for like a hundred grand. But this is my very, very first offshore. And to me, I could not be any happier. What I've put together when it comes to the original Royal Oak and a Royal Oak offshore at this point. You have your original Royal Oaks, stainless steel two-tone. I am working on picking up the gold version of it, although it's not as highly collectible, it's still expensive. And now I have the original offshore. I couldn't be happier having these three pieces side by side. It's a huge part of Audemars Piguet's history. And for me to own that piece of history going back to its very, very origins, it gets me excited. As I'm sure you guys watching are excited as well as watch collectors. So let's talk about the offshore. Obviously the Royal Oak offshore looks not a whole lot different than that from its predecessor, the Royal Oak designed by Gerald Genta. But uh, this was supposed to be the more rugged and the tougher version of the Royal Oak. That was the meaning behind all that stuff. And guess what? It proved to be just as successful, if not more successful, than the Royal Oak collection 
bigger size, 42 millimeters, right? We went from 39 to 42. Now there's variations and now you have 45 millimeters, now you have 44 millimeters. Let's look at some offshores. So I showed you the very original one. From that particular watch, there were so many variations that were born. Here's your bumblebee, right? Taken from the design of the, of the concept, they did the carbon case on the watch, and then they introduced a ceramic bezel, which started another craze all of its own, right? Ceramic bezels are now used on almost every watch brand, every major watch manufacturer out there. You're looking at yet another pioneering use of materials here. Now you sort of have a current updated version. This is the 45 millimeter. Again, this is an all ceramic watch, right? So the entire watch is ceramic bezel and case included. Let me go back a little bit. We want to talk about carbon watches. These are my, probably my favorite offshore out there in terms of wear. This is the most comfortable offshore to wear. It's the Carbon Alinghi. Since I brought up the Alinghi, let's talk about limited editions. Remember the limited edition craze that started with this very watch, which was the Montoya? I was the guy solely responsible for doing that stuff. I'm the guy that made this watch go from trading at $14,000 all the way up to $35,000. And rightfully so, this is a beautiful, beautiful watch. Here's uh, the Las Vegas limited edition. Again, PVD, another use of materials that people follow suit after the fact. PVD was a big deal and still is in today's watch manufacturing. And I did bring the Las Vegas uh, Turbion limited edition. This was done at the same time as the offshore I just showed. This is indeed a Royal Loak. But I just wanted to show you this guy real quick. Then there was the limited edition for boutiques. This was the, when they opened up the 57th Street Boutique in New York. They came out with this limited edition, right? The Alinghi, that long lived relationship with the Alinghi watch. I showed you the carbon version. Here's the rose gold version. Uh, then the offshore involved. You had your offshores on the braces, then you had your offshores on the straps. The Safari and the Navy are probably the first two you can think of. Here's the original Safari here. And then again, evolved into the Habana, right? It's sort of that brown offshore, right? A lot of these names that I'm giving are actually not names given by the companies, names that are given by the collectors of the watch industry and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, this guy is deemed the elephant, right? But there's nowhere on Audemars Piguet's website is this, is this called the offshore elephant. Uh, why is it called the elephant? Obviously due to its gray color. I think you're doing pretty damn well if uh, you know you got nicknames out there that are created by the general public every time a new piece comes out, right? That's pretty kick-ass if you ask me. Of course, Turbion. First offshore Turbion was actually not this guy, but its rose gold predecessor, right? Here's the platinum version of the first offshore Turbion, which in turn kicked off a slew of variations of that same exact watch. Here's another one in rose gold. This is a later model post that one. Didn't bring all the APs we have in stock. I did bring quite a few. There's still a lot more in the vault because I practice what I preach. This happens to be my favorite brand. It also happens to be my number one seller. This is a brand I'm passionate about and this is a brand that I love selling here at Luxury Bazaar. And rightfully so. When you put a passion behind a product, it usually will sell better than a product that you're not really all that crazy about. Of course, let's not forget the ladies, right? Uh, you guys know my wife's watch. This is the watch that she has, the limited edition Lady Alinghi in white gold, probably my favorite ladies offshore. You had the Don Ramon de la Cruz, limited edition offshore for ladies. Uh, then you have some current versions. This is just your plain Jane um, uh, ladies offshore blue dial diamond bezel in stainless steel. Here's a rose gold version of it. When we talk about offshores going on straps, I mean, the first thing you're gonna think about are the rubber clads for men, white and black dial, as well as the rose gold version. And then the ladies had the same thing. They first came out with one that was sort of that uh, light green color, then it had a plum color one, then they went to a white one, uh, then they went to a black one. And again, that had the rubber clad bezel, but then they did away with it and did regular bezels because those things tend to beat up and girls tend to beat up their watches a lot. So they kind of got away with all that and they went to plain Jane diamond bezels minus the rubber clad bezel. So the offshore certainly took off just as much as the Royal Oak did. I couldn't even possibly name or tell you the number of different variations that the Royal Oak uh, collection has today. Just on my desk alone, I have 10 different variations of the Royal Oak and probably about 15 variations off the offshore. Oftentimes, especially during the limited edition craze, they made fun of AP that they were making uh, limited editions uh, every other day while they were riding the wave and they were pretty hot at the time. Every single one of these limited edition offshores sold out. Every single one of them post the Montoya started selling at full sticker out of the boutiques and then reselling for a higher price. And uh, they picked up some really good ambassadors along the way. And a lot of these ambassadors were most of them were promoting the offshore or the Royal Oak on their hottest line. Let's talk about athletes. Obviously, the first one that's going to pop into your mind is the LeBron, the LeBron offshore that you guys seen me show here before. You had uh, Rory McIlroy. You may not have heard of him, but he's a very famous 
Irish golf player. Um, obviously, Leo Messi, you guys remember the trio that they made for him, the Royal Oaks, right? Uh, steel, platinum, and uh, rose gold. Michael Schumacher. Let's not forget about him. The Schumacher, till this day, is probably the most popular offshore next to LeBron and is still selling like hotcakes. Not to mention Juan Pablo Montoya that I just showed you here, right? Uh, Rubens Barrichello is another race car driver that they did the trio of, which was the titanium, rose gold, and platinum, as well as the rose gold uh, with that red dial. That was the Barrichello 257, right? Sachin Tendulkar, okay? Probably the Michael Jordan of Cricket world. Again, those that don't follow Cricket here in the United States, his name may not sound familiar, but for those of you overseas, you, you guys know who Sachin Tendulkar is. Everybody knows who he is. Serena Williams. Do, do I need to go further? Still this day, she still wears an AP while she plays, which actually always surprised me because, you know, she wears a uh, watch like this. Uh, she actually wears not the chronograph version, she wears the automatic version of the ladies' rose gold offshore while she's playing tennis. Pretty heavy watch to play tennis in, but she still does. And of course, there are more names. Uh, let's talk about celebrities, right? Tom Cruise, Kevin Hart, uh, Kim Kardashian, John Mayer, Harry Styles, Jay-Z. I mean, Jay-Z limited editions, you remember those guys, right? The ones that came with the iPod that's kind of obsolete now. I think it's the iPod itself right now is an antique, and they're all actually signed by Jay-Z. I actually still have that somewhere. Of course, there are many other celebrities that have been associated or have known to be wearing Audemars Piguet. Royalty, just the same. King of Iran, Mohammed uh, Riza Shah, I believe is his name, right? Juan Carlos I of Spain, Felipe VI of Spain. And then you had Prince Michael of Kent in the United Kingdom. And the list can go on and on and on. The list is very long. Much like other uh, major brand manufacturers such as Patek Philippe and Vacheron Constantine. I'm not trying to make it a surprise that this company has a pretty ridiculous dossier when it comes to famous people wearing their watches. Or being their ambassador should not be a surprise and rightfully so because this company is indeed a powerhouse. It was a powerhouse in the very, very beginning in terms of making super complex pieces. It's got the history behind it. It hasn't sold out to anyone. It's still an independent company, a company that's making buku dollars. 2018, they uh, showed a revenue of 1 billion Swiss francs, which is pretty darn impressive if you ask me. Last but not least, let's talk about their CEO, Francois, who is, I think is a genius all of its own guy that started as the head of uh, Audemars Piguet North America and has now become the global CEO. I think I want to take my hat off to this guy as far as a businessman, as far as a marketing genius. He's the biggest reason why Audemars Piguet recorded that kind of revenue in 2018. And it was his vision, it was his innovation to make the brand more exclusive, to go back to the roots of being that mom and pop company that was born in 1875 small exclusive with craftsmanship that's outstanding to this day, almost 150 years later. So this, in a nutshell, is uh, a quick stroll down memory lane um, uh, in terms of Audemars history. I wanted to do something a little bit different, and I really wanted to do something hands-on to give you the visuals behind what I'm talking about and why I'm so passionate for AP, why this is my favorite brand, why it's going to be continuing to be my favorite brand. I can't wait every year to see the new models that come out. Did you guys see the new one that just announced, the, the Ceramic Perpetual Skeleton? Uh, it's not out yet. It is on their website. They just announced it. I have Ian pop up a picture there. The minute that watch comes out, it's going to be trading like $300,000. You got a relationship at an AP boutique, go put a deposit down now. That watch is going to trade through the roof, and rightfully so. It's absolutely gorgeous. I love the black ceramic perpetual they came out with, and then they followed up with the white one, which I'm just as in love with. And this one is going to blow it all out of the water. I can't wait till next year's SIHH uh, to see what else. Uh, they have in store. Would love to see something new once again, like the Code 1159 they showed last year, which may not have been the biggest hit, but it was still nice to see the company to continue making changes, to continue trying something new at the same token, not being afraid of how the market is going to take to it. Yes, they're going to continue making Royal Oaks and variations of Royal Oaks because that's the one collection that feeds them and it feeds them well. But at the same token, don't be surprised if you see something completely different and out of left field from Audemars Piguet next year at SIHH. In the case, one of the, one of the other things that I wanted to actually achieve was the introduction of two new additions to my collection, which was the two-tone Royal Oak from 1972, much like my steel, as well as the original Beast Offshore. And I felt that this would be a grand way to introduce these two watches from my collection while talking about the history of my favorite brand, as well as showing you, oh, I don't know, a couple of million dollars worth of AP sitting on my desk at this point. And there is more downstairs. But uh, the purpose of this episode was obviously not try to show somebody how big my is, but at the so token, I think I did achieve that. But hope you enjoyed it. 
I want to hear all your comments below. Let me know your thoughts about the brand. Let me know which one of you guys are actually AP fanatics. In fact, if your favorite watch brand is Audemars Piguet, just comment me below and that will tell me everything I need to know. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. As always, like, share, subscribe, do all those wonderful things that help my channel grow. And I'll see you guys next week for more watch reviews and other videos.